Greetings, human development students. So let's go ahead and jump into chapter 16. Happy, happy last chapter on adolescence. So let's talk about what's going on psychologically and emotionally with our teenagers. This is like a big area, right? So first of all, Erickson would tell us that the primary achievement young people are trying to succeed at is going to be to form their identity figuring out like who you are right think of your high school years and there was such pressure to declare a major or figure out what do you want to do in life right so we're trying to figure out our identity a little easier said than done so erickson says that the kind of role or stage we're going through stage number five is identity kind of achievement versus role confusion. So he says that we are going through, you know, our high school years asking the question, who am I? Who am I? That is the primary question we're asking during this fifth stage of identity achievement versus role confusion. And our goal is to develop that. Our, our goal is to kind of attain this identity achievement. And, um, you know, along with that, what's going to happen is you're Young people are going to be experiencing different friends, exposed to different ideas, and it's during this time that they either determine, I am going to agree or embrace some of the things that my guardians, caregivers, parents taught me, um, or I'm gonna say, you know what, I, you know, I understand that that's, that's what mom and dad believe or whatever, I feel differently. We're gonna abandon some. So it's this time because, again, now they have full reasoning and, and analysis and logic and all those things. And so they're coming to some of these conclusions on their own. All right, so again, role confusion is when we kind of really don't seem to know or care like what, you know, about our identity or, or getting there to, to a place of achieving our identity. The term foreclosure refers to when a young person accepts a identity that somebody else wants for them and they accept it as their own. So Erickson terms really says it's a premature identity formation, which occurs when an adolescent adopts parents or society's roles and values wholesale without questioning or analysis. So let me give you an example. I had a student in one of my previous classes and the student told me that from the age of four, his parents told him, you will be a doctor. That is what you will do. And as he grew into high school and, and eventually you know, on to college, he came to realize he didn't want to be a doctor. He didn't. However, he was in my class because he was on his way to be a doctor. So in other words, he knew that this was not his choice that he actually would choose something else. However, his commitment to his family and his culture dictated to him that he practiced foreclosure, which is he took on the identity that they wanted for him, even if he didn't want it. That's foreclosure. Right, and you know, so there's a couple of different things that young people are doing. One of four, they're even gaining that, they're in role confusion where they don't know like who they are. They're not really even pursuing, trying to figure it out. Then they do that foreclosure that we mentioned. They accept somebody else's. They do moratorium, which moratorium right here is when they kind of put off some things by, um, okay, for instance, the big thing now is called the gap year. Right? It's, it's young people graduating high school and having a year before they either go to college or go to work or do whatever where they figure out things. And that's what we would call moratorium. You're kind of putting off that achievement. And then identity achievement. If we look at the picture here, we see it says no role confusion because these individuals have determined, I want to be a part of this family, the family of the armed services. When we go into the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, um, all of those, they function as a family. They provide you with identity. Because if you look here, everyone is dressed the same. Everyone will eat their meals at the same time. It gives a lot of people the structure and that identity that they want. 
So let's talk about four different adolescent identity formation, you know, stages or what we're looking at here. So our young people are really learning to form an identity in these four different areas, religious, political, vocational, sexual. So those are the four kind of primary areas they're investigating and trying to figure out. With religious identity, we really find that a lot of our young people um, tend to align with what their parents and their cultural religious identity might be. When it comes to political identity, similar, we find a lot of our young people identify with what their ethnic group associates with, right, and as far as politics. When it comes to vocational identity, so vocational means career. So when it comes to your career identity, well, it takes a lot of us years to get there. In other words, if you're 19 or, um, or you're young and you're working at Taco Bell, that might not be your life aspiration to work at Taco Bell. You're working at Taco Bell because it works around your school hours and you know it, it works for you, but you plan something else for the future. So it may take some time to do that. What we know from research is that our adolescents who have a part-time job and in that part-time job, they work 20 hours or more per week. There is a negative association with that. In other words, they tend to hate their job and they tend to not do as well in school. So having a part-time job is okay. We just want to keep it under 20 hours a week so that you can manage your you know, social life, your personal life, your family responsibilities, your homework, all of those things. Sexual identity, we find that, yeah, we're gonna talk about hormones are off the wall, right? Hormones are bouncing all over the place here at this time of adolescence. And we find that gender, there's this, we've talked before kind of about the difference between sex and gender. And gender refers to the cultural or societal attributes, um, characteristics, if you will, of being male or female. In other words, we as a society have socially constructed what it means to look male or female. As an example, it's kind of been a traditional gender role. You know, when I was growing up, man goes out and makes bacon and woman stays home and raises babies. That was it. It wasn't like an option. It wasn't an option for the man to say, okay, honey, why don't you go um, work in this amazing job you have and I'll stay home and take care of the kids. You didn't see that. Now we do, and this is a good thing because I think we're breaking some of these gender stereotypes. There's not a reason really why we have to say things like a man is the breadwinner and the woman is the one who stays home. I, again, I've, I've come across many single dads or stay-at-home dads who have done a phenomenal job of raising kids, sometimes better than some women I know that are moms, right? I keep thinking they don't have that nurturing touch. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about these socially constructed idea of gender. All right, gender dysphoria, we'll talk a little more about that in a case study, but basically we have a lot more of our adolescents or teenagers who feel like they do not identify with their biological sex. In other words, if they were born with male reproductive parts, they don't identify as male. We'll talk a little more about that. So what can we expect from our teenagers? We can expect a lot of conflict. So this is a time that there is gonna be high conflict with parents. So the parent, adolescent, parent, teenager conflict typically peaks early in adolescence. So needs, this is for, for a variety of reasons. Number one, your young person is pushing the boundaries with mom or dad or guardian. Number two, those hormones that are just whacking out and the hormones make me do stupid things. Yeah, they make me, act out in anger, they make me talk when I shouldn't talk, I should zip it. They do kind of, you know, they make me feel emotionally certain ways, right? And so this is a time that you're gonna get a lot of fighting with your kids, and not all families, but in general, we can expect this. Bickering is kind of um, maybe this little day-to-day -day type of annoyances. So for instance, if you and your sister bicker every morning because every morning she steals your hairbrush, and it annoys the stew out of you and you tell her not to take it every day and she just kind of comes back with her comments and you bicker. It can be really stressful to still go through those daily hassles, if you will. Uninvolved parenting is not what we want. In other words, a lot of parents figure, my kid's like 17, they can take care of themselves, they're gonna be an adult. Really, they still need you. They do. Um, I love when my son comes in my room to talk. 
about girls or whatever it be. Um, I just love the fact that even though he's a 17 year old boy, um, that we have a relationship that he wants to talk to me. So I'm happy about that. All right, so closeness within the family. So this is what our young people want. Number one, communication. So do parents and teens talk openly? You notice the keyword is openly here because a family can sit down for dinner together and you might have something like this where one adult says, so how was your day at school? And the teenager says, it was good. How was work? It was good. They turn to somebody else, so how was your day? Good. Good. Great. I'm glad we're all good. That's not really connecting, right? You're, you're having words, but you're not openly communicating. To openly communicate means you openly talk about things that sometimes aren't comfortable or at least you're being honest about some things. Like you can say, you know what? I had a really bad day. I'm really ticked off because, you know, this guy, you know, he made captain of the team and I didn't. And it, it sucks. Right? Be open and real and honest about it. Support. Do you rely on each other for support? This is one of my family rules, my home rules with my kids, is I tell them, you have to support each other. I don't want to hear my kids talk to each other in negative words. In other words, they don't get to call each other stupid or whatever. Um, and if one of my kids is in a sport or activity, we all kind of show up for the games and we support each other. We don't, if one of my kids says, you know, I want to be a ballerina and they're not very good at it. We still are gonna try and support them with no negative comments because that's what family does. We support each other, so that's important. Your, your child wants to know that if I go to my parent and they want me to be a lawyer and I say, you know, I wanna be an artist, are they gonna support me in that? Ideally, I probably wouldn't be the happiest if my child came and told me they wanted to be an artist because I know the financial challenges of being an artist, a successful artist, I should say. And so I would probably say something like, okay, so you wanna be an artist? Okay, we're gonna to go to art school. You're still gonna to have to get a degree, even though that degree might be an art, because I need to have something for you to fall back on, right? Because my job is to make sure that you are as successful in adulthood as you can be. Connectedness, so again, how emotionally close are you? As I said at the dinner table, we can be kind of superficial, or we can be really connected emotionally. Um, you know, are you able to cry with your parent? Are you able to really just let your emotions come out with them because you feel safe in that? Control, do parents encourage or limit autonomy? So we want to encourage our kids to make some decisions on their own. Like, you know, with my kids, sometimes they'll say, okay, well you decide mom and I'll say, no. This is, this is you have to learn to make decisions in life. And so you need to start now. And so I can't always make them for you. This is gonna have to be something that they learn. Authoritative parenting is the most effective during adolescence. So we said that. Authoritative is the style of parenting that has high communication both ways. We both talk to each other. It has love, touchy-feely love. And it has rules with flexibility. So structure, but I'm flexible and I'm willing to talk to you about something. If you think it's not fair, let's talk about it. Overall, your reactions as a parent to things your child says and does are just, I can't tell you how crucial they are, how critical they are. So let's give an example. What if a um, child says something to you, your, your, your 14 year old says something like, yeah, um, you know, my best friend Johnny, um, he, just, he just came out and told his parents that he's gay. And, and your dad says, oh man, I feel, feel sorry for that family. Man, thank God, I'm never gonna have to deal with that. What message did you just send to your child? You sent the message to your child that you can't talk to me about that. If that's how you feel, I don't wanna know about it. And that's not kind of like this, this openness that we're talking about. So if you're crucial or critical about things to your child, it will shut them down and you don't want that to happen. You wanna have openness. Right, another, like I said, again, as I mentioned here, how you react is critical. So I always, sometimes when I counsel with parents, I will do, to tell them to do role play. So I'll say something like, let's pretend your daughter came home, she's 15, and she tells you she's pregnant. And typically the dad will kind of lose it, right? What, oh my, what? you know, he will just go ballistic about it, and I will say, I'm glad we're role-playing 
because I would rather you lose it here with us than when she does that. Because if she goes in to tell you that I'm 15 and I'm pregnant, she is dying for your support. Now she understands that you may say to her, I am disappointed. I am disappointed because I had extremely high aspirations for your future. And I wanted you to accomplish so many things that I believe you still can, but now it's going to be very different for us. I am disappointed, honey. However, I love you. And we are going to be there with you through this. That's what we should do. And sometimes we just, we let our emotions get the better of us. And so if you get that phone call home that says, uh, your son's in jail for a DUI, right? And you walk in the, you know, you walk down to the county jail to go pick him up and your son looks at you and he can tell, you know, he's in trouble for a really long time and you like want to spit nails at him. Yes, we are angry at our kids and it's okay to tell them that, but make sure you say, I'm angry at your choice. I'm angry that you decided to get into the car drunk. I'm angry at that. I'm disappointed that you made that choice. However, I'm not disappointed in you. There's a difference between being disappointed in a person and being disappointed at the choice they made because they still have a whole future to make great choices, right? And so just make sure that we're not too critical in our judgments of our kids, right? And again, even though they're teenagers, we should be monitoring our kids, right? Um, my son always had a lot of friends come over to spend the night, and I know his friends. If he tells me names, I know who they are, I know their families, I know what's going on. I want that, right? I, I need to know where he is. I need to know he's at practice. He's just, there's not really times that I'm like, I don't know where you are. However, I don't really check in with him. Like, if he tells me, like, yes, yesterday, if he says, you know, I've had an event after that, so and so's having a party, a birthday party, we're all gonna go over and, Barbecue, watch movies, yada, yada, yada. Okay, no problem. I don't really need to check with him because he was home before curfew, right? So there's no need for that, but I do know where he's at. Being part of a warm, supportive relationship. That's our goal here. All right, so peers. A lot of us think of the word or the term peer pressure and we get stressed out because we think, oh my gosh, I my kids are gonna hang with the wrong kids. They're gonna start doing drugs. It's just gonna be horrible. However, there's some things we need to know about peer pressure. Number one, what is it? So peer pressure is when your child or teenager wants to act like or conform to their friends um, through behavior, dress, or attitude. Like that's what peer pressure is. They want to become like that. But here's some good things. It tends to decline after age 14. Another good thing is that we have to understand that peers are not always bad. Peer pressure can be a good thing. My oldest daughter um, was my firstborn, so she was, well, sorry, she's my adopted daughter, but she's still my oldest child. Um, and she was very competitive. And when she was in high school, she had two best friends. And the three girls were always on the dean's list, right? So they were straight A students. They were competing for everything. Every little essay contest, everything, they were competing. And so I felt like the peer pressure it's a good thing for her because her friends all were like her. They were like, we want straight A's. We were gonna, we're gonna go to college. Uh, we wanna get you know, scholarship money. And so they had the same similar goals. And so they pushed each other to achieve those goals. And so peers can be a good thing. You need to be concerned when the peers have behaviors or actions that don't align with your family values that you're concerned about. That's when you need to worry about their friends. All right, first love. Typically, our, our first romance is happening in high school. So you may have your first crush, your first infatuation, your first boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, right? So that's okay. And a lot, what's really good to know, as we mentioned kind of before, is that a lot of our adolescent relationships do not include sexual intimacy. This is a good thing. Like I said, I'm concerned about some of the ages of our young people becoming sexually active. And so a lot of our romances do not yet include sex. And this is, again, why I think we'll talk about you need to have the talk with your kids. So this slide is talking about virgins, um, students who have not had intercourse by grade. The blue is female. The gold is male. And so we can see here, starting in the ninth grade, we have quite a good high percentage of our young people not yet sexually active. However, as we go down to the 12th grade, that number greatly diminishes. So same-sex romances, you know, pretty, pretty common now in our uh, Western society. Sexual orientation. So what is your sexual orientation? Think of it this way. Your sexual orientation is really, 
who do you have the hots for? That's what it is. Sexually and romantically, who are you sexually and romantic, romantically attracted to? Someone of the same sex, someone of the opposite sex, or both sexes, right? It is your erotic desires, right? Like I said, when you think of who turns you on, which category of individuals is it? And that is your sexual orientation. During these teenage years, we tend to think of it as being very fluid, which means maybe it's not established yet. Maybe I'm trying some things out. Maybe I don't quite know, right? That's pretty common. All right, unfortunately from the media, from our television and our, our ads and magazines and billboards, we don't get a lot of information about STIs, sexually transmitted infections. They don't do that, right? So just picture, just, just think hypothetically, you know, think back to the last you know, Nicholas Sparks movie you watched or the last romance that you watched. So you have this, you know, the, the hero, the guy and the girl, and, and they finally get together through, you know, at the end of the movie, and, you know, they're in the process of going at it. Do you ever see, you know, them go, oh, hold that. We need to have a conversation. Do you have a condom? How many partners have you had this last year, right? No, you don't see that because that would ruin the music. That would ruin the whole flow of the Nicholas Sparks movie, right? So we don't see that part. And that's unfortunate because it sends this message to our young kids that, hey, when you're in the throes of passion, just, just go for it. We don't need to be concerned about anything, and you do. So when it comes to parents having what we call the talk, right, we find that our parents wait too long, right? I was 17 when my parents told me. It was mortifying. It was just horrible. I mean, literally, I wanted to just crawl away. So uncomfortable. They wait too long, they avoid specifics. So they're kind of gonna go like, well, you know, when you wanna make a baby, so you know, you need to be concerned about some things, and so just be careful, and you're kind of like, like, okay, what, what did you say? I'm, I'm not quite sure. And then they're uninformed about you know, they're telling you all this about, you know, prevention and whatever, and you're thinking, man, I've been having sex for two years now. You don't even know, right? So you're not even aware of your um, sexual activity. So these are some big pitfalls that we find, and I'm not going to go into detail here because you will have a um, reflection. I won't go into detail because you'll have a reflection activity where I really go more into the talk and the importance of the talk and how it is a, I believe it's a real a duty as parents for us to have put effort into having a really good open conversation, hopefully because you already have a great relationship with your kids. All right, the talk. So again, our, um, our, our young people are gonna learn from their peers and friends about sexual different activities. What's really concerning here is that only half of our couples or teenage couples actually have a conversation about getting pregnant about STIs. And so that's kind of scary that we've got so many of our young people who are not having that conversation. And then we end up with, again, unwanted teen pregnancy, which just changes lives. So from our education standpoint, um, you know, as parents, we want to avoid the talk, not me, but most parents want to avoid the talk. We think, oh, they teach them in school. They have those conversations in school. So you know what? I want them to teach my kids all they need to know, but I'm gonna argue it's, it's really not the school's job. It should be coming from home, because when you sit down with your kids at home, that's when you convey your values that go along with sex, right? Um, but here's something to be really mindful of. The European teenage pregnancy rate is half the teen pregnancy rate that we have in the US. That's a big statistic. And the reason it is, is because of the sex ed curriculum. Remember we said the word curriculum refers to learning material. So whatever they're teaching the kids, it's working. It's working and so we need to learn from that big time. Right, depression. So again, as we saw in the younger years, depression or self-esteem continu continues to dip. So self-esteem for both boys and girls dips at puberty, goes down at puberty. And again, it's sad because you should think the world is their oyster, they're young and all that, but 
they're stressed out because they want to fit in and they feel inadequate and they feel like they're not popular and they're not pretty enough or all of these different things. They don't have friends, all of this stuff that causes them to feel sad and then maybe possibly fall into depression. Approximately one in five girls is diagnosed as clinically depressed, one in 10 boys diagnosed. So therefore, these numbers are actually a lot greater because we're talking about actually diagnosis. We have a lot of kids that never do that. So suicide, talk about suicide. Cluster suicide is when individuals commit suicide together. Think of Jim Jones and think of mass suicides, right? So groups of people make a pact to commit suicide. Parasuicide is when we attempt suicide. So you cut your wrist or you did something. However, medical assistance was able to get to you and you did not die. So you attempted suicide, but you did, were not successful in that attempt. Suicidal ideation is thinking about it. It's thinking about suicide. So I'm gonna ask the question here. You're all, should all be at home? In the safety of your home here, but if you have ever thought about suicide, raise your hand. I hope you all raise your hand because all of us have thought about it. All of us. And I think the more that we talk about it, because it's a far cry from thinking about suicide to actually, you know, getting the blades and slitting wrists. Those are, those are two different things. But actually feeling down enough that you think about it is common it is common and it's mental health in general and suicide in particular is something that a lot of people and families they want to hide they're embarrassed let's not talk about how jimmy tried to commit suicide let's not talk about these things right however if we would talk about how common these feelings are then we wouldn't have issues of so many people being in the closet or so many people trying because they feel like they have no one who understands them and i just said a whole lot of us would understand you because we all felt that way too. And so suicide is just huge, right? The leading cause of death in adolescence between the ages of 10 to 24 is suicide. 4,600 young people in the U.S. die every year. What is, and this is a choice. This is not disease. This is not, they didn't die in a motor vehicle accident. This is a choice that a young person makes that says, I'm 15 years old, but I feel like I have nothing to live for, so I will kill myself. And that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. Because I wish so much that we could reach you. I wish so much we could talk to you. And that's why I'm so happy that Delta College is doing new things, like bringing emotional counseling to the campus. Because we used to understand that, yes, we need to provide academic counseling for students, but we know now that you as a student come with lots of stuff. You come with lots of baggage. I have baggage. We all have baggage. We come with stressors. We come with financial stress. We come with personal family situations. We come with all these things that interfere with my homework or interfere with how successful I am in class. And so we should address those emotional problems so I can be a better student and better person. And so that's my hope. That is my hope that we will continue down that road of helping students in that way. Right. Lots of our young people with sad thoughts. So the blue line is those who have seriously considered suicide. The gold line is those who have attempted suicide, parasuicide. And the green is those who have attempted it and they needed medical attention. And what I found really striking about this is look here at our ninth grade girls. And this is just a really high percentage when you look at ninth grade girls even compared to 12th grade, it shows us that that ninth grade year, that transition from junior high to high school is a crucial year. It's a crucial year because they're having sad thoughts, they're considering suicide, they're trying parasuicide, they're needing medical attention more than at any other time. Okay, ninth grade. So of course we talked about that, you know, our young people still haven't harnessed all of their emotional control. So sometimes they get angry. Sometimes they act out, right? Sometimes uh, my kids might make a mistake and say something to me that they shouldn't say, right? Um, they'll apologize later for that because, you know, they'll acknowledge they were tired, they were grumpy, they were upset about something else and they spoke disrespectfully. Um, but you know, the kids get angry. Our goal here though is to not have them act out on the anger in unacceptable ways. 
right? Unacceptable ways because this is where we end up. We, when we allow our kids to kind of go down that pathway, we end up in the juvenile department, right? Probation, all of that. And so remember I talked to you about defiance. When our kids are stubborn and they defy you, when you say no and they do whatever you said not to do, that is defiance. And as a parent, a guardian, you must deal with that. You must teach them, you must punish them in whatever way to teach them they have to respect your authority because they will have a boss, they will have a teacher, they will have people they need to respect their authority. That's the way the world works, right? And so they need to learn that. And again, moving on to shoplifting, bullying, all these different things we need to be concerned about. All right, um, so let's talk about drug abuse or drug use and, and other harmful substances for us. So most adolescents in the US have experimented with drug use. This is concerning. Um, looks like really only 20% have never tried drugs. That means 80% have, right? Um, so being aware of that, having conversations about it, that's fine. Tobacco is a drug that is very concerning if you start smoking under the age of 18. Because when we start smoking under the age of 18, before our bodies are fully developed, physically, mentally, emotionally, all of that, we can actually stunt our growth. So that means that we slow down our digestion, nutrition, appetite, even our height, right? So we don't want to stunt our growth because of you're putting a toxin in your body when you smoke. So it's a, it's a toxin, you're putting it in your body, and your body hasn't even been able to develop or grow to its full potential yet. Alcohol. Alcohol is the most frequently abused drug among North American teenagers. Actually, it's the most frequently abused drug amongst all North Americans, adults also. Alcohol. Um, again, when we say, you know, we're talking about excessive use of alcohol. We're not talking about, you know, somebody that has an occasional glass of wine. So heavy drinking can permanently impair memory and self-control. You know, basically it kills brain cells. That's what it does. Yeah, we're killing off the brain cells. Well, you know what? We all need our brain cells. We do. We need a lot of them. So we don't want to do that. In addition, alcohol affects adolescents more than adults due to their brain maturity. So for instance, if I took a 16 year old and a 35 year old and I gave them each five shots of tequila, the 16 year old one is going to be, you know, three sheets to the wind before the 35 year old. And the reason is because it's kind of like that alcohol just is saturated into this underdeveloped brain and they don't have the stamina that a 35 year old has to resist that intoxication level okay? and so it hits them more so they cannot drink as much they cannot all right so um, we're talking about you know alcohol or drug use things of that nature some of these are definitely part of our society and our culture our value system look at the culture and we talk here about um, Europe and Middle East in the Middle East alcohol is illegal and adolescents almost never drink it's just like not cool However, in most European nations, alcohol is widely used by adolescents and even children. So in Russia, it's very common to have dinner together as a family, and your nine-year-old is drinking vodka just like the rest of the family. They actually developed a very high tolerance to the alcohol because they start so young, but it's, it's acceptable, it's, it's expected. Um, I had a relative, my uncle, who worked in Singapore for many years, and he would tell me in Singapore, he didn't really like drinking, but in Singapore, on his, when he had business meetings, it was unacceptable to not drink. You had to drink to kind of seal those deals, or it was just, it was offensive to the culture if you did not drink. And so these are just some cultural things that we need to be aware of when it comes to alcohol. All right, so go ahead and go through your um, clicker slides here and reinforce what we're learning. And then I will see you then for the next chapter, 17, when we start talking about young adulthood. See you soon.